All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about uh, TPR petitions and how to defend against them. Uh, this is just sort of uh, almost in a nutshell what we've been talking about all day, uh, which is when you start thinking about TPR defense, you can't just think about the TPR hearing. Um, unfortunately for us, the, um, many situations, uh, by the time it gets to TPR, it's bleak. And so it really is sort of just a reminder that all of those things you got to advocate for early on. Uh, remember the standard at a permanency planning hearing, which we have to just start saying um, over and over and over again, is that the child must be reunified unless there's a substantial risk of harm to the child's life, physical health, or mental well-being. That's the standard in the permanency planning hearing. A really important point in Wayne County and probably in other service plans and the statute that, that they've had up there. Right. Substantial, yeah. Substantial, substantial compliance. compliance. Right. We're talking about return home, not necessarily termination of jurisdiction, yeah, but if the child game. is returned home, right. that's a game changer. So the next thing you want to think about is what can you do at a permanency planning hearing to prevent the ordering of the filing of a petition? And the law, and this is all drawn out from federal law, uh, contains a number of exceptions to this sort of presumption that uh, one needs to be uh, uh, ordered. So first, this only kicks in, this uh, sort of this presumption that a TPR petition needs to be ordered if a kid's been in foster care for 15 out of the last 22 months. It used to be in Michigan law that at the 12-month mark, uh, the court uh, basically had an obligation to order the filing of the petition. We changed our statutes to mirror the federal language. And so now it's really the 15-month mark where the sort of the presumption that a TPR petition needs to be ordered uh, is required. But there are huge uh, uh, exceptions to it. Uh, so the, one is the relative placement issue. If the child is being cared for by relatives, the court need not order the filing of a TPR petition. It's one of the big exceptions. The other is huge as well, which is as, you know, as broad as you can imagine, that compelling reasons exist that filing a petition is not in the best interest of the child, and they give some examples of what that could be. Uh, one is adoption is not the permanency goal, which makes sense, right? We need to start talking like, um, we need to stop talking uh, like termination is an end in and of itself. Termination is a means to an end, whatever that may mean. Adoption, maybe if the parent is that abusive, that relationship needs to be permanently severed because of sort of the seriousness of the harm. But this idea that we just terminate and let's just see what happens to the child's future um, is sort of, uh, not necessarily child-centered. And so I think the exceptions get us into that. The adoption exception gets us to think about how if there isn't an adoptive home or a plan or even older youth in care, then um, it may not be appropriate to, to uh, terminate. The last point is about sort of reasonable efforts, that another exception is if the state hasn't provided the necessary services, um, then, uh, then that's an exception to the uh, ordering of a filing of a petition. You just need to know this. So when you get to that 15-month mark, it is not simply enough for the state to say, it's 15 months, we have to order a petition. If these exceptions apply, or if you can come up with a reason why it's not in the child's best interest, um, both state and federal law allow you to make that argument. Prior to ordering the filing of the petition, the court also has to consider the views of the child. This is a provision in the statute that is rarely uh, talked about, which is that uh, at the permanency planning hearing, the child shall obtain the child's views regarding the permanency plan in a manner that is appropriate to the child's age. There's an SCAO memo that sort of talks about what that means, and I think makes clear that it could be the child's own voice, it could be the views through the lawyer guardian ad litem, um, but all too often I feel, especially with um, sort of lawyer guardian ad litem practice, that the views of the child don't often come across because the lawyer guardian ad litem has this sort of dual role that they need to also advocate for what they believe is true. That oftentimes that is what dominates the conversation as opposed to what their client actually wants. It's sort of this schizophrenic role we've created in our, in our system that someone has to do sort of both of these things. Not uh, only that, the kids should be coming to these hearings. Kids should be coming to these hearings, right? So I think though that, especially if you have an older youth or a client, a kid who uh, you represent a, a parent whose kid you believe opposes termination, we have to make that parts of our record. Because oftentimes, again, when you're looking at this case after a TPR happens on appeal, 
we have no idea. It's very, very, very hard looking at a record to figure out what this child, actually, how the child actually felt about the potential termination of the, the rights of their parent. And my reading of this provision is it, we, ha we, uh, we, we are legally obligated to elicit that views in a way that's appropriate for the, uh, for the child's age. Yeah. Is how the child feels in the current moment uh, admissible? Is that something that matters in an appeal if the child's opinion has changed since being placed? In for an appeal, it would not matter. For an appeal, an appeal is when we appeal, uh, you're looking at the record uh, at a moment of time, in theory. Uh, and so uh, when I'm, you know, on remand, it could matter, right? So if you remand saying the court didn't consider the views of the child, you need to do that before you terminate. And then you get reversed and you remand. And on remand, the kid comes and testifies and says, I'd like my, the rights of my parent terminated. Then that would um, certainly uh, alter things. Yeah. And I feel if I'm in the capacity of lawyer, guardian, and item, and my client says, I want to go, I have a duty to express to the court, okay, well, yeah. this is how my client feels, this is how I think it should happen, but I, I think you have a duty to say what how your client feels. Yeah, and it's not only you, it's plainly in our statute. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's, if you look at 17D, it is there that you have an obligation to make the child's views. Uh, readily sort of available to the court and say it, and then the, and if there's a conflict, then the court ha should appoint an attorney. But I think you're right. What happens is all the talking is, all the adults carry the day. So if you have a jail, and they have rightfully are able to express their own views counter to their, the position of their client, um, that has more credence as a court. But when you have a kid come to the podium and say, I want to go home, it, I think it, it dramatically changes the hearing. It does. And so just remember that when you're looking at the law, this is sort of your anchor. And I mean, the, the LGAL statute certainly says that they have to present the views of the child, but the court also has an obligation to make sure those views are heard. How can I get a copy of that uh, jail memo? I think I have it. So I can send it, you know, in this like lengthy email we're going to send out in theory <laughs> with everything we talked about today. <laughs> what is that? It's right here, Ken. Uh, it's one long continuous, never ending training. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so we'll figure out a way to, to get Tracy's writing it down right now. So we'll figure out a way to get it. Uh, so these are just sort of basic things about uh, TPR petitions. You can sort of uh, look it up. Uh, the court may uh, suspend parenting time. doesn't have to. It's based on the child's best interest if it's a supplemental petition to terminate. Uh, no right to a jury trial, but if it's uh, an initial dispo, you have the right to a jury for the adjudication stage, and then the judge would determine uh, uh, termination. Uh, the rules of evidence, as Tracy said, you know, the, at the adjudication stage, it's uh, confusing. No one really applies them. It's even more confusing at the termination stage. Um, and so basically the rule is that if it's an, a termination at initial disposition, the rules of evidence apply. If it is a, term, a supplemental petition, whether the rules of evidence apply, and this is the statutory grounds, depends on whether the grounds alleged in the supplemental petition are related to the grounds for jurisdiction. Not the grounds in the petition, but the related to the grounds of the finding of jurisdiction. So let me give you an example. If uh, the department alleges uh, drug abuse in their petition and the parent pleads to drug abuse and there's later allegations of physical abuse, they would have to, in their supplemental petition, prove the physical abuse by legally admissible evidence. If the department alleged in their petition that there were grounds for drug abuse and physical abuse, and the parent only pled to drug abuse, they would still have to prove the physical abuse uh, with legally admissible evidence. Uh, so it's just something that you see in, when, when, when looking at records, this is all, people just assume that the rules of evidence do not apply in a lot of, in a lot of jurisdictions. And so everything gets in. And I think you just need to be um, knowledgeable of the, of the rules to figure out whether you want to object and how much you want to object. So just as a practice note, what I do is I grab the petition that my client pled to. Yeah.
And so you, see, you see the confusion that could take place, which is you could have a, one statutory ground where hearsay and inadmissible evidence is, or hearsay evidence is allowed. You could have one allegation that's a new allegation where the rules of evidence would apply, and then you have best interest where the rules of evidence don't apply. And so it, so it, gets, it requires a lot of work on our part really to make sure that when something is coming in, let's say just for best interest, that we have to object and have the trial court uh, and, and instruct the trial court that you cannot consider this for anything other than best interest or else they'll just lump it all together and you get in front of the Court of Appeals and you complain about it and they'll say you didn't object, sorry. And I will say that so part of it is a county-based difference though too. Some counties are very meticulous in how things are introduced at dispositional hearings where witnesses are called, witnesses are cross-examined, things are marked, things are introduced. I know in Wayne County it's a little more formal than it is in Washtenaw where we just get to sit and talk about stuff, and, uh, and there's nothing actually introduced into evidence. Um, so, I, but there's, so that there is a little bit of a distinction based on what's. So remember that, so a couple of things, uh, timing-wise, 42 days, two-part determination, you got both statutory grounds, uh, only takes one ground to terminate, uh, and then you have uh, best interest, which now is not, it, it's an, an affirmative obligation the department has to prove. Uh, statutory grounds is clear and convincing evidence, best interest is preponderance. Um, that's from a case called Inri Moss, um, where the issue was whether that best interest should be clear and convincing as well. Our Court of Appeals said no, preponderance is a standard that is, uh, that is required. That one might get fixed too by statute. That's in the bill statute. Yeah, so that, that could be, get fixed as well. Uh, so when it comes to best interest, we've talked about this uh, when we talked about the case law update. These are some of the cases that talked about uh, relative placement as something that the court needs to consider as a factor uh, against um, TPR. Since Mason, you've had a bunch of remands. Uh, for, I mean, since all of Mets, you've had a bunch of remands for trial courts failing to consider it, um, but nothing has really substantively affected the ultimate outcome. Do you argue that then the, the, uh, the issue about the child with the other parent? The, the case law is not good on this issue. So, yeah, so I, I would. No, so, there, there, the Court of Appeals case law that I've seen. Has, has basically said this line of case law does not apply when a kid's living with a parent. Uh, because they're just, like, they're, looking, they're just looking for a way. It, it, the same rationale should apply, but it does not apply. There is this. But the court rules say that parents aren't relatives. Correct. The statute, right. the statute says that, yeah. Correct. But the same rationale that you, I mean, so I think that, that the same rationale in thinking about the need to terminate would, would apply in both sorts of situations, right? That, that if you think of termination as a sort of the infringement of a constitutional right, and you're thinking about sort of this least restrictive means idea, that you don't do this unless you need to do this, then the same sort of logic about a, you know, a custody order could, could deal with this issue in a way that you may not need to terminate, could, could occur unless there's evidence that the parent is so harmful uh, that termination is required. But to answer your question, there is case law that says, looking at the statutory definition of relative, saying, uh, no, this, this stuff doesn't apply there. Uh, we got some of the things. Kim, and this, the case that uh, Kim had uh, cited, Inri White, has a lot of this stuff consolidated in one. And these are some of the factors uh, that exist uh, that, you know, stability, permanency, bond, parenting ability. The advantages of a foster home, while the court cannot cons weigh the advantages of a home, as it's related to the statutory grounds for termination, it can, according to our case law, as we're talking about best interest. So you can have testimony uh, about how good a child is doing in his foster home, how the foster home wants to adopt, that sort of thing, as it relates to, um, to the best interest finding. Um, so a couple of things. I mean, this is very similar to some of the stuff with the adjudication uh, tips. Review it closely. Move to strike irrelevant stuff. There's often 
CPS uh, investigations that are unsubstantiated that may be in there, criminal arrests and not convictions, uh, request discovery. I always use 3.922, um, even though technically worded, it's uh, sort of focused on trials and the adjudication trial, and this is not a trial, this is a, sort of technically a hearing, um, but I've never had problems um, uh, getting access to documents, and by then you have a lot of the documents as well in a, in a case. Um, you want to review the case with the client. It's a lot of the initial steps. It's almost like a brand new trial in a way, uh, in a brand new process. A lot of the stuff you want to continue to investigate it, um, explore settlement possibilities, uh, whether that's guardianship, custody. Uh, some clients, uh, as was stated before, may want to release, and that may be a way for them to continue having a relationship with the child if they have a good relationship with the foster parents who are then going to adopt. That's certainly at least something you want to talk to your clients about. Um, again, you know, our job is to be client-centered and make sure that what our clients want is being effectuated in the case, and part of that involves exploring um, all the different options. And a voluntary release could also have potential uh, beneficial impacts as it relates to future children, um, because we have a statute that, that limits the use of a voluntary termination or a voluntary release in future cases, depending on the allegations that are, um, that are made. Um, this is sort of tra Tracy's theme that you want to just make sure you root whatever argument you make in the statute. And if you walk away with nothing else from today's training, it is like we need to be really oriented in the language of statutes when we're making arguments, really oriented in the language of sort of constitutional provisions and case law, just to cite support for what it is that we're saying. And so I think that was the problem. In Re Mason is all based on our system's collective failure on reading subsection H of the, of the uh, of the termination statute, which has like three clear parts to it, and we just read like part one, which was he's imprisoned for more than two years, we're done, and we didn't sort of think about um, the other two aspects of it, and we have a sort of a very uh, textualist uh, courts, uh, appellate court system, and when they look at stuff, they're looking at all of this, and um, we need to start doing that as well, and, and making arguments really based on the language of statutes. Um, Special considerations, uh, TPR and initial dispo, uh, the rules of evidence apply. I, you know, one of the interesting arguments that I think uh, is ripe for the Court of Appeals is this question, and we had alluded to it earlier on, about reasonable efforts and when they need to be provided and when they cannot be provided. Um, if you read Inri Mason, Inri Rood, look at 19A2, uh, basically those uh, cases, I read them to say, you must make reasonable efforts in all cases unless aggravating circumstances apply. But then you see cases in the Court of Appeals like HRC and a line of other cases that simply say if the department requests termination, that basically they are then, uh, and uh, a court can terminate without them ever providing reasonable efforts. And that there's published case law at the Court of Appeals and there's yet to be a, a serious attempt to reconcile those two strands of case law and we haven't had a good case yet um, that has done that. Um, so maybe one of you will have that case uh, to, to do that, but it's just something that needs to be sorted out um, because uh, looking at the statute, it says one thing. Mason seems strongly to say that the aggravating circumstances define reasonable efforts, but then you have a significant number of cases on the other side that, that say... So if you look at the timing of things, you know, like HRC was before Mason, um, and like there's, you know, like, so, and, but HRC is sort of a confusing case because it was kind of an aggravated circumstance exactly. case, but they had lots of language in there that was very broad. So it just, yeah, we just need the right case to really sort of make that issue apparent. Two, I think. Yeah.
the controlling authority to the court. Let's just do that. I mean, you know, chances are, given the weakness of uh, representation. Yeah, but the risk that. Uh, now, they uh, will the, the court of appeal, yeah. Probably, but. So, I mean, that, that's a, sort of a strategy question. I would never do that only because if you're sort of banking on, on a court not finding what I think now is pretty relevant and obvious case law in their own court on this issue. And it just hurts your credibility as an advocate if you... Well, why is that case I, was overruled by the Supreme Court? By implication. That's what it yeah, means. except there's been lots of case law post-Mason yeah, at the Court of Appeals. That, 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 so. It's all unpublished, though. All the yeah. case law that didn't follow Mason on this point is unpublished in the Court of Appeals. So, so I would agree that this is an issue that, like, that is worth us litigating. My own advice, if, if it were my case, is I would raise all the case law and explain why Mason is now controlling on this issue and those unpublished decisions aren't, I'm not sure I would encourage sort of ignoring that body of case law that exists at the Court of Appeals, but just because they're going to discover it and then look at you and, and basically say in their heads, why didn't this lawyer bring this up to my attention, even if you didn't have an ethical obligation to do it, um, persuasively, I, I, I always like to raise the counter arguments and then try to attack them as opposed to hoping that they won't find the... Right. Because we're going to have an adoption case. Right. You know, not a, not a case anymore. We went through Henry Mason. Just, uh, you know, if you have a case with an incarcerated parent, remember participation through 2.004. They have a right to participate, um, at least by phone. Kim and I will talk about whether they have a right to physically appear uh, and have that conversation tomorrow. Uh, and, uh, and then they have to provide reasonable efforts. Um, and that's sort of the main takeaway. They have to, their department policies talk about going out to the prison uh, and, and really working with, um, with the family. Um, ICWA, MIFPA, if you get there at the termination stage, remember beyond a reasonable doubt, active efforts need to be proven. They have to have the testimony of at least one qualified uh, expert witness. Uh, and the expert witness, there was a recent Court of Appeals, a published decision within the past year, that the expert uh, witness has to be somebody who says that continued custody would result in serious physical harm. There was a case at the Court of Appeals where they did have an expert witness, but the witness actually opposed the termination, but the judge terminated anyhow, and they were arguing, well, we had an expert witness, but it has to be an expert witness uh, that continued custody, and they sort of interpreted that to mean to testify in support of the proposition that continued custody would result in serious emotional or physical damage to the child. Um, some of the common defenses that we use, uh, reasonable efforts, if the agency failed to make those efforts, you have, you know, I try to like sort of uh, put termination cases in sort of two, uh, two categories, a couple of categories. One is that when, you know, when we have a parent who has not complied with anything, that's in sort of the bucket of this is really hard to win. Then you got the parent who has uh, complied, uh, which is a lot uh, more, uh, more, more helpful. And then you have the benefit issue, right, that you got to show not just compliance, but you want to be looking for examples during parenting time, um, therapist reports, to really make concrete that they've not only complied with those services, but really benefited from them as well. In that first thing of, um, uh, of, of a parent who has not been able to comply with services, you're really looking for some explanation, which hopefully has been raised at the dispositional hearings throughout the case. That is a struggle that, that we have, is you know, if you raise at the TPR hearing, that they didn't give bus tokens, um, but it's the first time you're raising the issue, you're gonna have problems, right? If you raise that the parent had a job that got in the way of drug testing, but you haven't been raising it all along at every review hearing, chances are you're not only gonna uh, receive an unsympathetic response from the trial court, uh, the Court of Appeals won't care either. And so you have to, just like with the ADA issues, if you see an issue, put it in writing, make it part of the record, do it early and often to make sure that um, uh, that uh, it is preserved in the record. The idea of TPR causing more harm than good, particularly for older children where there's no permanency plan on the other end other than independent living. I think those are the cases that we really need to think, uh, we need to start making the argument or continue making the argument that what is the point? It, it, it is often the case that one flawed parent may be better than nobody. And there are some judges, there's a judge in Illinois named Patricia Martin who talks about you know, her views on, on terminations, 
and how for some of her older youth, it is better to have that parent who's a substance abuser who still calls this child on her birthday every year, still visits once in a while, will go to the high school graduation, even if she knows that that child will never be placed permanently with that parent, because the alternative of taking that one caring parent away uh, legally from sort of being involved is far worse. And so this idea that there's a balancing of harms in every one of these cases uh, is something that, um, that we just need to make sure that courts um, understand. And then the other ones we've, uh, we've chatted about. Uh, advice of rights, so we've got the appeal process. Um, you can uh, make sure that clients know about that. It's 14 days to have an appeal as of rights. So it's a, kind of a sprint for clients. Our job as att trial attorneys, even if you're not handling the appeal, is just to make sure that, um, uh, that uh, clients know that and invoke that right. In other jurisdictions, there's a lot more, uh, while appeals are pending, attorneys have been much more success successful in getting things like visits to continue until an appeal uh, is, uh, is concluded. In a close case where you think that may be something uh, th that uh, you, could, you, you can ask for it. I mean, it's in, it's in our arsenal, which is you could ask the decision to be stayed pending appeal, uh, like, like any decision can be stayed, and you can ask for visits to continue until the Court of Appeals decides it, perhaps in a really close case where a judge is struggling, a judge may be willing to, um, uh, to do that. You always have the right to ask the Court of Appeals to stay a decision pending conclusion. Again, if there's sort of serious legal issues that need to be resolved, that may be something uh, that you may be able to litigate um, as well. So that's all we have regarding termination or anything else at this point. Um, are there any uh, questions that folks have about either termination. Uh, this has been a great conversation today, uh, and we really appreciate for having the chance to chat with you from start to finish about a lot of these, uh, a lot of these issues. Um, we will put together some resources and try to send them out to folks, um, the things that we've mentioned today. Uh, and if you want to join our listserv, just shoot me an email, uh, and I will add you to our list. Can I join again? You cannot, yeah, can you join again? It's like the fourth time you've joined. Uh, any questions? Anything else? Kelly, is there anything else that we need to announce to people? Or, yep. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for having us.